Greetings. I'm sorry I couldn't attend the Fantasy and Critique conference in person, but I'm very grateful that you have allowed me to present my comments via video. And so the title of my talk really is Against Catastrophe, Historical Negativity, Eros and Revolution in Adorno, Bloch and Marcuse. These three thinkers associated with the Frankfurt School are seminal thinkers, I think, for the consideration of fantasy, critique, utopia, and historical liberation, both previously in time as well as con contemporarily. And while my comments really will be constrained to examining these, the thought of these thinkers rather than applying them to current reality, I think it will be quite obvious that their analyses are rather relevant to consideration of our own predicament, given environmental problems, mass deprivation, political terror, and war without end. So these thinkers really share many things together. They are all Marxist Jews who came to mat maturation under Nazi Germany, under conditions of Nazi rule. And this, of course, was a shattering experience for many Western Marxists uh, because it showed sort of a, pre it presented a threat to Marx's theory of uh, inevitable revolution, the inevitable triumph of communism and workers' control. Nonetheless, they ha so consideration of this problem, of this Nazi catastrophe, was central to the thought of these three thinkers as of all the other Frankfurt School theorists. However, consideration of this deep predicament was not, a, was not total. They, they always considered that historical progress was a possibility, however grim uh, its chance and prospect given capitalist conditions of rule. And so, with these introductory comments, I'd just like to frame this, uh, their thought in this way. So turning to Ernst Bloch, principally his work, The Principle of Hope, Das Prinzip Hoffnung, which has three volumes. In this, Bloch really is looking at the problem of hope. He is defining it, he is coming to understand what it is, he is exploring it in many of its manifestations in everyday life. He notes that hope is a possible um, expectatory emotion. It is positive as opposed to despair, which is expectant and negative. He notes that it is militant, that it helps to unfurl banners, that dialectically it allows the deprived to dream of futures that are free of conditions of domination, exploitation, and repression. He says that hope is hoping beyond the day that exists, the day that has become. It is anticipatory. It predicts the, f the future totality of liberated life that will come after the revolution. Hope is not yet become. It is foredawning. It is future seeing. Bloch locates this moment in many experiences of everyday life, in daydreaming, in art, in consideration of beauty, of nature. Like Adorno and Marcuse, he sees animals and the non-human, the natural, as suggesting values of non-use, that is non-instrumentalized use, intrinsic value, things that are subversive to the instrumental domination of capitalism. He says that hope and optimism for a liberated reality and future stands at the horizon of every reality, however impossible it may seem, however grim everything seems to be given polit politics and external relations of domination. Failure does not have the, the last word. Hope presents a brightness and a future of liberated time. He says that hope really exists only when it is not actualized in reality. That is, if only if utopia were to be realized would hope cease to be a reality. And so the enduring problem of hope, the enduring problem of our non-realization of liberated experience of abolishing the state, capitalism and patriarchy, racism, imperialism, that hope allows us, gives us more motivation and drive to serve those ends, to pursue them. He notes that life is redeemable, that human reality can be changed, 
and that reason and mind can help toward the realization of this ends. He says that the, that the historical defeat of liberatory impulses, such as the Nazi catastrophe, such as capitalist rule, none of these are total. They can, mere, they can merely only be temporary. In this sense, he is very similar to the French philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty, who notes that, that the radical changeability, the plurality of life, rescues the human world from despair because of its malleability. He says in his closing words of the, of the first volume of The Principle of Hope, that hopelessness, indifference, and despair are the most dogged enemies of the realization of socialism, and that without these values reigning in existing society, grand capital would stand alone. Hence, he believes that critical militant optimism is justified, and that it is, in, that it is intrinsically and fundamentally an important value in the struggle for liberation. Moving now to Theodore W. Adorno, who was more negative in much of his thought than that of Ernst Bloch. Adorno, of course, is very famous for noting that the world, in his words, is deeply ailing, that the world's essence is abomination, that the existing rule by the bourgeoisie ensures doomsday, that there can be no good life in the bad one, or, as was previously translated by Jeffcott, that wrong life cannot be lived rightly, that there can be no good life in the bad one. Adorno suggests, reflecting centrally as he did on the event of Auschwitz, of the Holocaust, of the industrial genocide perpetuated by the Nazis against the European Jews, he interpreted this as, an, as evidence of history being a permanent catastrophe, that capitalism and imperialism and fascism were merely continuations of this trend toward catastrophe. He notes that rule by mon monopoly capitalism, like Franz Neumann in his analysis of, of Nazism in Behemoth, that that ensures the same conditions that ruled in 1939 to 1945. With these things in mind, with the depth of the severity of the crisis as Adorno was looking at it, at the threat of nuclear warfare, at genocide perpetuated against the Vietnamese by the US imperial powers, and other horrible relapses. For Adorno looking at all this, he suggested that progress, historical progress, could only be understood as the aversion and prevention of catastrophe. That though the revolution has failed, as he puts it at the beginning of negative dialectics, that the moment to realize philosophy was missed, that the relapse has already occurred, that existing society ensures catastrophe and that total annihilation is the objective potential of bourgeois society. He suggests that this work of historical progress is precisely to halt domination, to halt domination of the self, to, to halt domination among humans, social domination, as well as to halt the domination of nature, external nature, non-humans. He says that this, the chance for this progress comes when humanity takes, takes reason into account and comes to acknowledge its own indigenousness, its own naturalness to nature, and to halt its domination of nature. He suggests that progress is the attempt to thwart the triumph of radical evil. It is resistance to the threat of relapse at all stages. In fact, his theory of progress was used against him, was used against Adorno at the end of his life and probably very much contributed to his own death, given that Adorno was very reluctant to endorse the German left-wing student movement that arose at the end, toward the end of his life in 1968-1969. For this reason, he was accused of being resigned of being an apologist, in, a sen in essence, for capitalism and for imperial rule. Responding to this in a famous short article entitled Resignation, Adorno notes that the eye that does not want the colors, or rather, that the eye that has, that has visible the happiness of humanity is 
that which is visible to the thinker, and that anyone who has that thought, as Adorno always did, and as was central to all of his social thought, from the authoritarian personality to investigations of fascism um, and capitalist culture, uh, that that happiness cannot be erased from the, from the mind of the thinker, and that anyone that has that thought cannot be said to be resigned because he or she, having it, would demand utopia, would demand the liberation from capitalism. Similarly, in negative dialectics, he notes that there is a resistance that is indelible from the fungible world of barter. This resistance is that of the, of the eye that does not want the colors of the world to fade. He notes that, all, that, no things can be, that no things can be seen in life without tra reflecting transcendence that this utopian light permeates all and rescues it, again, as Merleau-Ponty or Bloch might say, from inevitable disaster. He does not say that the world course, as disastrous and catastrophic as it is, as it was in the Shoah against the Jews, in Vietnam against the Vietnamese, in the industrial genocide that is threatened by nuclear warfare as well as environmental collapse, he does not say that despair is absolute given these conditions. Rather, only despair is the conclusiveness of the world course. Instead of this, instead of perpetuating bourgeois coldness, which is possible, Adorno says, only in capitalist society in which egoism rules above all, and in which no one's interests can be said to rise beyond those of everyone related to them, for example, in family, Against this, humanity can, ex can express its love, can, can exercise its mind and its critique, so as to overthrow the totality that threatens relapse and catastrophe. In this sense, Adorno is far from resigned, and he believes, though he does not endorse political revolution, other than in very abstract ways, such as through consideration of nature and the beyond that nature suggests, as well as that that art suggests that the mind can move to this position, but not that it can be necessarily instituted now or at any point in which he was living. Nonetheless, his work is entirely important to consideration of this subject as well. So the last thinker that I'll be considering in my comments today is that of Herbert Marcuse, who of course is central to this conference uh, with his comments on fantasy uh, as well as critique. Marcuse as regards eros and revolution and historical negativity, like the other two I've considered in this talk, really these things were central to his social investigations. Eros, of course, was his interpretation of Freud, for example, in Eros and Civilization, in which he posited that the erotic drive that Freud finds in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, which he wrote after World War I, of course, uh, the erotic drive, the sexual drive, um, negates the death drive, the tendency for the organism to die. Um, Marcuse interprets this in a more Marxist way. He understands the possibility of liberation as a historical one. He understands, he critiques Freud for not uh, positing this possibility that the historical basis created by capitalism could dialectically be overturned and used to institute liberated social conditions, freed from repression and scarcity, necessity, material want, as well as instinctual and social repression and domination. In this sense, he finds very much a, an anti-systemic reinterpretation of the proletarian struggle through the erotic drive um, and the attempts for life to overturn the dominion of death that is represented by capital and the state, as well, of course, as fascism, which, as Marcuse posits, is merely a development of liberalism. But the main work that I would like to focus on today with regard to revolution and historical negativity is that of Marcuse's Reason and Revolution, which is his main work on George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Now, Marcuse interprets Hegel in a very interesting way here, one that is very unorthodox or heterodox to many of its interpretations, especially among anti-authoritarian leftists and anarchists, for example, who are very dismayed by Hegel's ultimate interpretation, or rather his 
uh, sanctioning of the state as the realization of reason in history, Marcuse, instead of this, notes that reason, that Hegel's original formulation of reason as a principle to be instituted in reality and in history, the Geist or the spirit, that this is essentially a critical notion, that it is one that defied feudalism, one that defies capitalism, one that defies rule by private interests and private property. This is, of course, one that was picked up very centrally by Marx in his early writings and permeated his entire career, of course. But in any case, Hegel finds that the non-realization of reason in history signifies absolute negativity in terms of history. Marx would reinterpret this as being understood as universal suffering, Marcuse, universal negation. As so, against the non-institution of reason in history, the non-institution of freedom and of thought, of use of mind, Marcuse finds Hegel as positing the possibility of a universal revolution, one that in the first place destroys the negative totality of capital and the state, and that secondly establishes a new one, establishes a new reality and a new world, a new set of social conditions. Marcuse in this work is very keen to interpret and to advance the idea of dialectics, that is to say, that any consideration of reality cannot be a complete one if it does not give rise, if it does not give space to consideration of development. He gives the example, as Hegel does, of the flower, that consideration of the bud can, can also continue into consideration of the blossom that the flower becomes. This can be applied to many situations, of course, development in human life or in animal life. Many examples can be found. Marcuse finds the dialectical method to be essentially critical. Again, however strange or contradictory Hegel's ultimate endorsement of the state was at the end of his life. Um, and so Marcuse reinterprets reason against this, suggesting that reason can only be instituted by, f by freedom and by mind. He defends Hegel against the positivists, Auguste Comte, Saint-Simon, suggesting that the establishment of reason as a principle that Hegel posited is much more critical and that fascism, in fact, has its roots in positivism, which likes to celebrate the existing reality and tends to have people conform to it. German idealism, in this sense, is anti-conformist, says Marcuse, given its dialectical interpretations and centrality. And so revolution really for Marcuse, as he writes at the end of the aesthetic dimension, his last published work, seeks to protect and promote and to advance the freedom and happiness of the individual, like art and like Eros. So for Marcuse, like Adorno, as well as Bloch, Eros, through reason, can come to destroy historical negativity, revolution, that is, the institution of radically different social relations, the overthrowing of the, of the debasement of humanity and the destruction of nature can come in this sense to dialectically negate existing reality. To close then, I would just like to say once again that I think that these thinkers and their proposed philosophical methods as well as their rather vague programmatic implications that would arise from consideration of these realities, of these posited philosophies, um, leads us once again to, to consider existing reality in all of its negativity and in all of its unredeemed nature. I would just like to close finally by stating that of course this talk was slightly dominated by male voices and so I would like to simply here at the end acknowledge Hannah Arendt, for example, with her consideration of natality as posited in the, in the human condition on revolution and many of other of her works, as well as Simone de Beauvoir and her consideration, her conception of freedom as implying the ability to overcome given conditions and to have, be open to new ones, to overcome 
as Rosa Luxemburg might say, through the general strike, through socialism, against barbarism. Thank you.